How can the Bible be the world's all-time bestseller, yet remain the most misunderstood book ever? Because people so often refuse to believe that it means what it says, it is twisted, maligned, and misrepresented. Most who study the Bible benefit little or not at all. They become confused, discouraged, and give up, saying, I just can't understand what it means. You can be an exception. There are 12 fundamental rules that govern proper Bible study, but most ignore, misunderstand, or know nothing of them. Yet when properly applied, these basic rules unlock treasures of doctrine, prophecy, instruction, knowledge, and more contained in God's Word. If your mind is open to the truth, you can apply these rules to understand God's Word. Here they are. The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack. Modern Christendom misunderstands, twists, perverts, and ignores the many plain truths of the Bible. Over the centuries, it has replaced every true doctrine with a cheap counterfeit. This has been possible because certain less easy to understand passages of Scripture can be easily misrepresented, made to say something they do not. It is these verses that invariably become the vehicle through which a false doctrine can be introduced, with almost no one able to recognize it all may have begun with a single wrong scriptural premise. Most students of Scripture do not build doctrinal understanding by beginning with the clearest verses on any subject. Rather, they enter God's Word with preconceived ideas and search for passages that appear to support what they have assumed it teaches. This makes them candidates for confusion and deception. The Apostle Peter stated that the Apostle Paul wrote some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Knowing how most people think, and completely unaware of any rules of Bible study, teachers and scholars can easily take advantage of the way parts of God's Word have been written. This applies to more areas of Scripture than what Paul wrote. The theological institutes and seminaries of this world have developed a systematic way. This can be done consciously or unconsciously. See Romans 8, 7 and Jeremiah 17, 9, of spinning or dismissing God's plain words and meaning in favor of making passages appear to say what they need them to say. These theologians and religionists portray, actually sell, Satan's doctrines through use of specific verses wrongly understood that supposedly teach their ideas. This permits them to come from a basis of Bible authority for beliefs. This helps them easily snare the unwitting and unwary. God warns of dishonest teachers who handle the Word of God deceitfully because they receive not the love of the truth. But this also applies to any of their students willing to quickly believe them. God's servants, true ministers, Never, under any circumstances, follow this practice. If one is properly trained and sufficiently grounded in the truth of the Bible, it is easy to see through and expose deceptive logic misapplied to a verse and explain it correctly. Fifty years ago, a journalist exposed Christians' ignorance of God's Word. This has only grown worse today. The account begins... A Protestant pastor administered a Bible quiz to the members of his congregation. The questions were very simple. Anyone with a general knowledge of the Bible should have been able to answer all of them easily. The results staggered the pastor. Only 5% of his flock made a commendable grade on the test. 15% failed to give a single correct answer. 60% were unable to name the four Gospels. 75% could not identify Calvary, Golgotha, as where Jesus was crucified. The vast majority of Americans today are Bible illiterates, he wrote. They simply have never read the book they profess to regard as the Word of God. The reporter concluded, A great many people have turned away from the Bible because when they do try to read it, they find they cannot understand it. 
To the modern reader, it has a remote and antiquarian flavor. It is likely to leave him with the impression the Bible is an ancient history book that has no real relevance to his life here and now. Another quote shows how society considers biblical knowledge unimportant. J.B. Phillips, author of the Phillips New Testament translation, wrote, It is one of the curious phenomena of modern times that it is considered perfectly respectable to be abysmally ignorant of the Christian faith. Men and women who would be deeply ashamed of having their ignorance exposed in matters of poetry, music, or painting, for example, are not in the least perturbed to be found ignorant of the New Testament. Christians are to know their Bible. They should always seek to grow in grace and knowledge of God's Word. Let's examine the 12 rules for how to do this. Rule number one, ask God for guidance. Before beginning your Bible study, ask God to open your mind to better understand spiritual principles. Also pray for guidance as to what to study. Then focus on a particular topic, book, or chapter. As God opens your thinking, what is confusing to most will become interesting and exciting to you. First review Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. Slowly and carefully digest each verse and each word of these eight verses. We must all come to view God's Word in this light. Asking for and receiving understanding from God is no small thing. Many scholars and men of great intelligence have mastered the Hebrew and Greek languages. They spent entire lives translating and analyzing every Bible verse, but did not understand the messages being conveyed. For example, James Moffat translated the Bible into plain language, but its meaning was lost to him. In the preface to his final edition, he wrote, This is great literature and great religious literature, this collection of ancient writings which we call the Bible, and any translator has a deep sense of responsibility as he undertakes to transmit it to modern readers. Here was an intelligent and highly educated man, yet, without God's Spirit and guidance, he saw the Bible as mere literature. Adam Clark, author of a six-volume commentary, also did not truly understand the Bible. The Pharisees of Jesus' time were men of great intellect who studied Scripture for endless hours, yet all in vain. If these and other men of great intellect failed to grasp the message of God's Word, don't assume you can study it and on your own automatically understand. Only by asking God to open our minds can we understand His Word. And understanding will diminish as soon as you stop asking for guidance. True understanding comes from God. Rule number two, study God's Word for correction. The second rule is related to the first. Sincerely petition God to correct you through Bible study. This should also be part of your prayer for guidance and understanding. The Bible shows when and where we err in life and what to do about it, both the diagnosis and the prescription. Notice, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Another key scripture on correction comes from the prophet Jeremiah. Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Wanting correction ultimately comes from within. Christians earnestly seek and desire God to straighten their path. Now read this. Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hand made and all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Humility and trembling before God's word go hand in hand with seeking correction from it. And remember to concentrate on correction of self, 
not others. Read Matthew 7, verses 3 to 5. Rule number three, prove all things. God commands Christians to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Prove means to put to the test. The first thing that should be proven is God's existence. The fallacy of evolution, which attempts to explain away the existence of an all-powerful creator, has made it difficult for some to completely dismiss lingering doubts. There exists an abundance of well-written literature proving creation is the only explanation for the existence of life and the universe. My five-part series on God's existence brings undeniable proof of an all-powerful Creator God. Also, my two-part series, Can a Christian Believe Evolution?, will open your eyes to incredible New Testament proof from Jesus confirming the Genesis creation account. Scientists and design engineers prove or test finished products. God also commands to test Him. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, God says, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Many have put God to this test and discovered He does what He says. Finally, consider the example of the Bereans in Acts who were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. The Bereans searched the Bible to prove the Apostle Paul's teachings. This is consistent with 1 Corinthians 13, which shows love rejoices in the truth, believes all things, and hopes all things in God's word. Prove means to get to the truth of a matter, and then accept that truth with positive assurance. If you have not yet proven the authority of the Bible, read our booklet, Bible Authority, Can It Be Proven? Rule number four, God's Word never contradicts itself. Most theologians believe it does, and many professing Christians claim the Bible cannot be taken literally. Such statements expose ignorance of the Bible. God speaks of His consistency, and He is plain. I am the Lord, I change not, and Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Archaeology and fulfilled prophecy add to the overwhelming evidence that the Bible is never contradictory. One supposed contradiction is Proverbs 26.4, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like unto him. Now verse 5, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. These verses are complementary, not contradictory. Which to do depends on circumstances. Verse 4 tells Christians to not degrade themselves by petty bickering and arguing. Don't debate someone who is obviously trying to stir up contention. Jesus applied this when teaching in the temple. The chief priests, elders, and scribes came to him saying, Tell us, by what authority do you these things? The temple authorities were not seeking advice or understanding from Christ. They wanted to catch him condemning himself. Jesus responded with another question. He answered, I will also ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then believed you him not? But, and if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered that they could not tell whence it was. And Jesus said to them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Politicians can't be pinned down, and Jesus knew not to bite. Had he answered any other way, a war of words would have ensued. But he saw their motive and did not stoop to their level. Knowing a question would stop them cold, he avoided needless strife by not answering foolish leaders according to their folly. Now verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Think, 
In some circumstances, not answering a challenge could cause the questioner to feel he prevailed. One should respond in such cases. Know which is which. A good example was Paul's reaction to the Corinthians when they were being led astray by false apostles. This was no time for silence. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul made his point. False teachers often boast, and these were, his credentials and sacrifices dwarfed their puny claims. Proverbs 26, 4, and 5 do not contradict each other. Both verses offer wise instruction. Rule number five, find out what the Bible really says. Applying this rule usually by itself resolves misunderstandings. Many misconceptions result because the world is blind to the truth of God's Word. For example, professing Christianity universally teaches that Jesus used parables to make his meaning clearer for the supposed simple minds of the first century. Not so. Why did Jesus speak in parables? The disciples said, Why speak you unto them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Why can't the world understand this? Spiritual blindness. Jesus continues, For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not, from him shall be taken away, even that he has. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, or fat, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted." This is fascinating. Jesus explains that because people close their minds, he says he makes sure they stay closed for now. Jesus also told his disciples, his church, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. The world's opportunity for salvation will come when God calls the masses later. That blindness may be lifted from your eyes should be humbling. God may be calling you now. If so, it is the biggest reason you can understand the Bible. Rule number six, examine the context. Context simply means with text. Checking context involves reading the text before and after the issue in question. Understanding context is vital to grasping the correct meaning of scriptures. Context points to the intent of a passage. It generally will answer who, what, when, where, why, and how. It is careless to read out of context because of statements like, You shall not surely die. To determine whether this is true, context is everything. In this case, Satan was deceiving Eve. Checking context takes the reader back to Genesis 2.17, where God told Adam, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. God's obvious meaning is you're as good as dead, or you will die in time. 
False teachers more easily deceive people who don't investigate deceptive practices, like taking verses out of context to misapply them. One of the many benefits of recognizing proper context is that it builds resistance against deception. Rule number seven, here a little, there a little. One verse cannot establish doctrine. A person must gather all scriptures on a subject to see the full picture. Those called by God realize that without His Spirit leading them, the door to true understanding is closed. And we saw Jesus use parables to hide meaning from the world at large. This applies to understanding the whole Bible. God's Word is written in a way that defies understanding on the physical level. Notice this. Whom shall he, God, teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts, meaning adults. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We must diligently examine verses throughout the entire Bible to gain true knowledge and understand doctrine. This requires being led by God's Spirit. Continuing, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. But ultimately it was, they would not hear. These verses show an intentional hiding of meaning by God, as if it were a foreign language. But Israel also showed a willful rejection of the truth. They would not hear. Verse 13 adds, The word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Notice that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken by wrong understanding. Again, see the unmistakable hiding of the meaning. The next example shows the need to draw from precept upon precept or line upon line. You will see that verses people call contradictory actually supplement each other. Here are four verses critics say demonstrate contradiction about what was written on the stake above Christ's head. Matthew 27, 37 says, Set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark 15, 26. The superscription of his accusation was written over the King of the Jews. Luke 23, 38. A superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the King of the Jews. John 19, 19. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Together, these verses show Pilate did the writing and that four versions were written in three languages. All four contributions from four authors give a complete account. The full picture emerges by assembling line upon line. Rather than contradicting scriptures, the four Gospels together work in harmony to present a complete understanding. We conclude part one with seven keys to understanding God's Word. Although these keys are general overviews, they are vital to understand true teaching. Read and internalize these short summary truths. First is the true Gospel. The kingdom of God will be set up on earth for 1,000 years in the near future. Second is that salvation is creation. The process of salvation involves the development of godly character in those who are called and who overcome. Third is the principle of duality. Duality runs through every phase of God's plan. For instance, the physical creation and the spiritual creation, the first Adam and the second Adam, Christ, the old covenant and the new covenant. In prophecy, duality indicates the type and the anti-type. This means the former fulfillment as opposed to the later, climactic, major fulfillment of a prophecy. Next is God's holy days. These seven annual Sabbaths spell out the plan of salvation. God commanded these be observed forever and forbids observance of pagan holidays. Fifth is the truth about Israel. 
This involves the identity of the lost tribes of Israel and their importance in the world today. It also involves the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh as inheritors of the birthright, as well as the identity and location of the other tribes. Without this knowledge, prophecy cannot be understood. Sixth is, the Bible interprets its own symbols. Avoid injecting personal speculation, which blocks understanding. Let the Bible explain itself. As with parables, symbols are often used to hide meaning, not make it clearer. Finally is God's Sabbath. The Seventh-day Sabbath is the test command that mainstream Christianity refuses to obey. Yet this is the identifying sign of God's people. With just these seven keys, apart from the twelve rules of Bible study, you can study with much more understanding. There are five more rules. Part two presents them, along with additional practical points for effective study. Don't miss it. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646.